Hey, Vanderpump Rob's listeners. As we prepare for season 11 of Vanderpump Rules, I wanted to release an old episode from behind the Patreon paywall. A couple years back, my buddy Bill and I watched The Row, starring Lala Kent for Halloween. It was a spooky movie and a spooky podcasting experience, but I thought it would be a non-spooky, fun little bonus for all of you listening in on the Vanderpump Rob's public feed. So, if you would like to gain access to a bevy of bonus content, head over to patreon.com slash Vanderpump Robs, where, yes, you'll get bonus episodes, but you'll also get all of the public episodes ad-free. And if you join at the Pumptini tier, you'll get video episodes. So, patreon.com slash Vanderpump Robs, check it out now. We know the cast of Vanderpump Rules loves to put on costumes. Well, we're not wearing costumes during this episode, but I had special guest Bill Tilly of Bill and Rob's An Excellent Adventure join me, and we used a conference service because I was on the road while we recorded this episode. Quality isn't bad, it just sounds slightly different. That's okay, because... The content of today's episode makes up for the traveling recording that is our talk. So, what you need to know is that although we're talking about a spooky movie, the episode is funny as hell because Bill is a very clever guy. If you haven't heard his other podcast and my other podcast, Bill and Rob's An Excellent Adventure, go check it out because there's a lot of fun to be had over there as well. Now, on with today's very spooky episode. Welcome to Vanderpump Rob's, a sexy, unique recap podcast hosted by me, Rob Schulte. See, here's the thing, everyone. It is the spookiest month of the year, October, and I have got, well, the spookiest guest ever. Just kidding. I've got my good friend, Bill Tilly, here. Hey, Bill. Rob's, how are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Repeat guest, Bill Tilly. I know. This is shocking. I didn't expect to ever be back on this wonderful show this great host and luckily thanks to a profound friendship he has decided to forego all my audio shortcomings and bring me back to pester him one more time longtime listeners of vanderpump robs will know that uh i have splintered i have this show and i also have bill and robs and excellent adventure which you are the co-host of uh started relatively recently as of this recording but We've gone through our first season, we've got our bonus Trancers episode out, and we were like, you know what, we should do a bonus episode that's spooky in the Vanderpump Rob's feed, but how do we tie it together to the Vanderpump universe? And Bill, we we had to have been racking our brains for that for like, what, an hour, maybe? Close to that, at least an hour five. Yeah, oh, of course. Which, uh, what is it? What's the spookiest episode of Vanderpump Rules? And then we realized that uh, Lala, Lala Kent, was in a horror movie produced by Randall Emmett. And I believe what? this might be, is this the movie that got her the Range Rover? <laughs> Pretty sure this is the one. I think this movie probably would have been better off if it had just been called that. This got me a Range Rover, at least... That would have been a little more descriptive of what's going on here. But yeah, this is the legendary movie that if you watch VPR, you will see them talking about throughout the course of one of the seasons. One of the later seasons, like season eight or somewhere in there. Somewhere around there. Yeah, because this is what, a 2018 movie? Yeah. Wow. Hard to believe. Good Lord. Well, This was very important to me to know what year this is because I had to do the math. (laughs) <laughs> to uh, decipher that you've uh, well, we've got so we've got a 28 year old trying to play 18. So that right there sets up the aura of suspense that any good horror movie needs. There is a lot of age discrepancy in this hmm. movie that I I think we're going to have to at least attempt to get to the bottom of. But until then, we should at least. Say that we are watching The Row from 2018, or would that, I don't know what the Greek symbol is. Is that a lambda? 
the R lambda W. I, it's is that the infinity equation symbol from Thanos? Did he like come down and just kind of shoot this movie into a different universe when it came out? Because that's what it feels like it is. Yeah, and it's not lambda, but it is one of those. You know, think of the movie symbols. Don't they actually say that that is the symbol for row. I. Bet they do, Bill. I think they do. I'm, we're going to go with that as our answer. That's what that and means. I'm sorry. They should have used theta because that at least looks like an, an O with a little bow tie in the middle of it. But, but uh, this movie looks like it should. Nobody looks like a teenager. Nobody looks like an actual police officer. It doesn't ugh. look like an actual school. So honestly, it kind of fits in with and everything. everything's kind of yellow in the whole movie, too. Yeah, has a tint to it. It does have, it's It's like it's steeped in tea. That's for (laughs) sure. And why Lisa loves it, you know? Maybe, maybe that's what it is. Uh, Allegedly. I don't think Lisa actually likes this movie. But tell me this, Bill. At the beginning of our Bill and Rob's episodes, we have a way we read the synopsis, which I have over here. But would you like to inform the guests? Because maybe listeners of Vanderpump Rob's have not yet listened to bill and rob's an excellent adventure yeah we do a little thing to keep everybody up to speed something other podcasts might forget we give you what we call the back of the box where we just basically tell you what the movie's about as if you were reading it in the video store so you haven't seen the movie you can at least have a gist of it and follow along as we attempt to discuss and review this pick uh, this piece of film so give take them down a little trip down the row rob's yeah, this would definitely be in the rows and aisles of Blockbuster and not on the hot walls on the perimeter. That's for no, sure. No, this is not going to be under you must see. Yeah, not at all. And we will rate this as such soon enough, everyone. Don't worry. But the back of the box for the row goes as follows. The anxiety of Rush Week turns into sheer terror when sisters of a sorority are slain and turned into dolls by a serial killer. Now, new Pledge Riley, Lala Kent of Vanderpump Rules, and her best friend Bex must endure late night hazing rituals as the murderer watches and waits. Can Riley uncover the terrible secret shared by her cop father and deceased mother, a former Phi Lambda sister, before becoming a victim herself? Now, far be it from me, Bill, we usually stay fairly positive on Bill and Rob's. Like, the whole ethos of the podcast, uh, Bill and Rob's An Excellent Adventure, is that, like, what one person's trash could be another person's treasure. You know, like, we aren't hate-watching things. We are finding the joy in it and the joy in this movie might be just knowing that it exists and how terrible it is but even reading the back of the box it says the deceased mother a former phi lambda sister like we don't even know that's the sorority like so in context clues sure but even the back of the box is written poorly i can you believe it i can i can't <laughs> believe it I've seen the movie, so I don't have any problem believing that somebody that probably helped write the script helped write the back of that box. This movie is trying to be a couple of things. It's not succeeding at any of them. It's trying to be a thriller, trying to be a psychological thriller. It's trying to be a bit of a crime movie in certain places. And then it's trying to be a horror movie. It's not doing any of them particularly well. So what I would call this movie is sadly bad. I would just call it bad, unfortunately. It evokes like this feeling of like the early 2000s and like late 90s sex comedies, you know, like the like, hey, we're at college, American pie, yada, yada, yada. Like it's sexy. People are hot, but it's also like raunchy and this, but it's not. So Randall Emmett is a dirtbag. Um I'm sorry, Fofty, if anyone knows this. He, he, Of course he produced this movie, which is why Lala's in it. That yeah. whole relationship is, is, is terrible, but like you can see this like Randall disgusting gaze through the whole thing. It's like, hmm, can this shot have more TNA in it? 
Please, let's do it, regardless of anything else. Yeah, and you can tell because it's shot in a way that the person doing it, it's it's that leery, really, like you said, douchey version of it, yeah. too, because it's not like the stuff that you would see in your average slasher sex exactly. comedy or any, like, there's really, you see a lot of girls and you see some guys. You don't really see much of anything as far as, like, levacious or egregious nudity. It's almost, it looks like a really badly shot Girls Gone Wild video. Like somebody would shot with their phone back in the day and yeah. said, this is the movie. I think somebody started to write this movie and it, like you said, I think you hit on the head, it feels like a really bad ripoff of Silk Stockings from the late. <laughs> yes. Like this is the idea of what sexy is. It's really big close-ups on body parts and pouty lips and something and it's like it's not the movie's definitely not sexy in any way no. shape or form so i don't know what randall was going for but he missed his mark really really bad and in a sense it makes this this movie's kind of a lie because it's not any of the things you would look for in your typical horror movie and that is it really tries to evoke it from its title and its look on the box it kind of looks that way but it starts out as a as a cop movie yeah and i'm looking at the director uh Maddie Beckerman and you know he's he directed the row and he directed Alien Abduction in 2014 and that's it he's done some producing and a little bit of writing but it's unfortunate it feels like well we need a director but this is a Randall Emmett film and I'll tell you what I want in this movie yeah it's definitely something that a bunch of people with just enough money and just enough friends were able to do because the whole movie is shot in somebody's house yep. and near what appears to be a school and a construction yard for a police department. So that's kind of weird. Like the whole thing is very patchwork. It feels very fan film. I've seen fans yeah. on the internet that look much better. And this movie's only 2018. So it's not like <sighs> this is a very old internet movie or a very old way of looking at it. It's all fairly new, but between the, the really bad shaky cam and the non ability of any of these people to emote in any way that you can pick up on. I spent the first five minutes of this movie watching Randy Couture around in a warehouse that we will see again later that is supposed to be a different location, but is not, it's clearly the same warehouse and I'm thinking he's the, and when you watch the credits, you'll see the names and at the end. Yeah. Like, and so-and-so. And when I, when your and is Randy Couture, who has the emotional range of a brick being tossed into a washing machine, you're in for, you're in for some trouble. This is the only movie I've ever watched where five minutes in, I'd stop and take a break. Yeah. It, it's, it's tough. And it is about five different ideas for a movie stitched together you've got the cop movie that you brought up earlier you've got like this uh, i accidentally shot my buddy in a hostage negotiation but also my wife died so i'm a grumpy cop um you've got his daughter lala who's riley going to college and you've got the lala story of her joining this sorority that uses a social media app called The Row, which is completely disregarded about five minutes after they discuss it. And you've got her friend who comes in at the beginning of the movie and at the end of the movie, but is supposedly supposed to have Bex. She's supposed yeah. to have been there the whole time. And uh, there's no purpose at either end of that movie. Either end. It's just a person who could probably shoot for two days, and that's why they got her. And then you've got the whole killer scenario where the whole time I was like, this movie is so predictable and written so poorly that I'm guessing the twist will be that Lala is killing all of these people because she found out her mother was in the sorority and her mother had died, right? right? So the twist would be that she's like exacting revenge on the sorority, right? Right. And to me, I'm thinking while watching this, like, oh, what an eye rolly predictable twist in this movie. But no, no one even did that. Like no. that was too too high above what this movie was capable of. 
Now, this movie lacks a serious editor because it's all being funded by Randall and his buddies. And they've fallen into that classic trap of you've surrounded yourself by guys that are all yes people going, that's great. That's a great idea. This is what we'll do. And then we'll do this. And then we'll do that. And it'll be great. And it'll be great. They're just throwing bits and pieces of old stuff into the mix. And then it's like they put it all in a hat. Then they wrote, this happens to you. And they handed the hat to the actors. And I say that in air quotes. And they pulled out that bit. And then they were like, oh, I get to be this person that dies in the shower. I get to be this person who dies on the roof. It just kind of, it doesn't flow. It just clunks along. And you will go from scene to scene with no reason at all why the next thing is happening or why anybody's doing anything. Because there's no driving force to this movie at all. You can tell there was an attempt. There was an attempt. But like. The row being the app was like so much of like, this is how we communicate. It's a secret app for all of us. Oh, yeah. And we're supposed to like assume that's how the killer knows. But when we find out who the killer is, and we'll talk about it in a second, there's no possible way they would have had access to the app. No. So the, app, the app's not a demon from hell. No, nope. uh, the app's not a technological marvel that has taken over something. It's, it's nothing. It literally serves no purpose in this movie whatsoever. And yeah. It's strange because the movie doubled down with, okay, I get it. This is supposed to be Sorority Row, which very sure. little of it happens in Sorority Row. And Sorority Row has not a lot to do with physical things going on in the story. Yes, there is a backstory in there, which is a little contrived, but that's fine. You know, tropes are tropes for a reason. I'm not expecting award-winning material out of something like this. <laughs> Like, they all thought of it. They wrote down the idea on the napkin. They stitched all the napkins together, and it, none of it makes any sense. It doesn't go anywhere. Not at all. I want to talk more about, like, the type of of movie this is and like the era it's made and, and why this fails as a horror movie. But before that, we should just get to the point of like, who is the killer in this movie and the killer in this movie, Bill, because this is, this is so funny to me. We learn that Lala's mom and correct me if I'm wrong here. Lala's mom like killed herself because of the guilt from hazing this other woman who killed herself is what we're told is what we're told. And we learn that Miller played by Shea Buckner, Shea Buckner, who actually has some credits. He's been in like the blacklist and shameless and equalizer, you know, he's a working actor, like way more credits than anyone else that we've actually clicked on so yeah. far on IMDb. <laughs> He squeezes out the most he can out of this movie. Yeah. For the it, worst possible story, probably the most believable actor next to Lala, quite frankly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what we learn towards the end is that no, Lala is just a victim in all of this. She starts falling for this guy because he's not a fraternity dude. He's got he's a working stiff valet who happens to charm her to death. Well, not Steph. She stays alive. But um, <laughs> well done, Rob. Thank you. Uh, I've already written a better line of dialogue than in this entire movie <laughs> without even trying. But he ends up being the killer because he is the brother of the woman that was hazed so bad that she killed herself, who was a peer of Lala's mom. Mm -hmm. Now, could he be the brother? Yes. Could he be a brother that was anyway over the age of like eight at the time that this happened? No, he could not be. I picked up on this too. Unless they put him in cryogenic stasis day after it happened, he is way the wrong age to be who he says he is. So when you find out he's the, like, let's say younger brother of, of the woman who died. Yes. They gave her a name, but like the, the fact of the matter is, is it's just in story alone. Right? right. And so you start going, OK, that's weird. But then it's like and she called me and told me how 
terrible she felt like when he's giving his old villain monologue and be like wow she's like talking to like an eight-year-old or like a 10-year-old about like <laughs> terrible hazing at sorority during college that's that's a bit much like talk to a peer or something and then he goes on in his villain monologue to say that so he drove out there like, okay so he's at least 16 at least 16 years old 20 or so years ago maybe uh-huh. 30 um and then actually he killed her did you catch that yes, he killed lala's character's mother and set it up to look like an accident yeah or no they set it up that she had killed herself so that yeah lala and her father would spend the rest of their lives regretting did he also say he killed his own sister no, he didn't say he killed his sister. Okay. He got there when to watch her die. Okay. And, he, and then he set up I knew he set up Lala's mother to look like she killed herself, but because his sister burned herself to death, so he set it up to look like Lala's character's mother set herself on fire and committed suicide that way. So why and, didn't he just kill the other two? Yeah. And he just killed the dad. Why the long game here for someone who's looking great for his age? Quite frankly. Really, really. He has got a serious Dorian Gray thing happening. Here, <laughs> is what I started calling him after that. Because I'm thinking, all right, so was he just a happy, val- happy, well-adjusted valet? And then because these murders start taking place before she comes, the day she gets to college. So yeah. does he have access to the register and saw the name? And out of all the names, I don't even know what her last name is. I've forgotten it at this point just decided I'm just going to become all that is serial killer, which it's, it's ridiculous. It is uh, Riley Cole and Riley her Cole. father's name, detective Cole, detective Cole <laughs> and daddy. And that's all. Yeah. There is, is detective daddy Cole and daddy. Now, I uh, shared a scene from this movie on my TikTok, Bill, that there are two scenes in this movie I want to talk about. And I hope you might have at least one that we can discuss as well. But um, they're prime examples of why this movie is no good Um, or, or that there was zero thought put into it. It was pushed out to be a cash cow, obviously. And I can't imagine it even made that much. One is at the very beginning when Daddy Cole is dropping off Riley Cole at school. He's getting ready to move forward in his car and almost hits the house mother of the sorority. And she's like, hey, I'm walking here sort of thing. Uh But if you look, there's another car directly in front of him. So it's not like he could have even driven forward. It was just a forced interaction in the script for him to recognize this woman he knew who was friends with his late wife. Right. It's it's super contrived. And I will attack on the part where he, as a law enforcement officer, a detective, we didn't know this, we just know he's a police officer, responds to the honking parent behind him, getting out of his car, and going full UFC rage and showing his badge to this guy, basically asking him if he just wants some. Yeah, because he also says, "Do you want to? Do you also want to see the gun or something?" Be like, that is such a no. <laughs> also, a the no. very accurate depiction of a shitty cop. You yeah. know, like He's really bad at his job. Very bad at his job. He's not serving or protecting anyone. He's also like trying to catch the killer in this movie, and he's not assigned to the case. So he's suspended for killing a partner in a drug raid that they fairly feel if they apparently they thought three cops was enough to take down an entire warehouse full of drug runners at this definitely point. not the raid. Oh, um, it's, yeah. That scene is it, it kind of, it kind of comes in early and sets the tone for the things you're going to see. Absolutely. Now, my other example I was going to tell you, Bill was there is a scene where Riley and Shay or sorry, Riley and Miller, Lala and Shay are on a date. And don't don't be confused. This is not Michael Shay. 
This is uh oh, is, and not even Sheena Shea at that. No. This is Shea Buckner. No, so if only if only Sheena could have been the killer. God, we are gonna we got to watch that uh TV show I found that Sheena's in the Detective USA Up All Night style vignette move oh. TV show. Outstanding. Um, yeah, anyway, so Miller and Riley are on this date, right? And they're flirting up a storm, and they're talking about, like, you know, I, I think Carter Carter West, like, the most, the most frat boy script name. Uh, anyway, she's like, he was there. I think the one of the girls that died went home with him, and he's like, Miller's like, oh, yeah, you should turn him in, blah, blah, blah. She's like, oh, but if I turn him in, uh, it could ruin his life, and I'm not sure. And it's like, oh, who's writing that one? But also, Miller then leans in for a kiss, and boom, dad pops in the frame and goes, I'll take it from here. Oof. And we're like, where was the script supervisor here? You're, you're, you'll you take the make out from here? What? Oh, it was so bad. It's such a clunky transition into it you're just waiting for something to come out it's like this is where this movie's gonna go it's just yeah. gonna, does this pivot i can believe it at this point because one we've never at this point up till now seen riley's mother do this whole thing there's no flashback there's no picture you can get a good look at you don't even get a name for the longest time and i'm like all right well maybe dad's just decided that you know she's a perfect substitute for his dead wife and we'll just take this movie in that weird direction but Thankfully, that does not happen. Yeah. Well, Bill, is there any scenes that we haven't yet talked about that you feel need discussing? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about two. And one is the one thing this movie really doesn't do a good job of is doesn't give you any location placement. They don't really set up where it's supposed to be. Of course, it's Los Angeles because they shot it in this is where they live. So they they generally use they borrowed a lot of borrowed property and a lot of borrowed houses and things like that, and wherever this university is supposed to be. But they don't tell you that. So no. you see a lot of weird imagery of like these kids are super rich, they have to be incredibly wealthy to go to this school because they go to Riley and her Bex get invited to a pool party. At one of the sorority houses. The sorority houses are Beverly Hills housewife levels of huge. This place is enormous. There are thousands of people. It is straight out of an MTV spring break video. And <laughs> I know, it's the grind. It is. And while we all know movies aren't real, that's why they're movies. But this is an impossibility. We've all been, I've been to college, I've been in these places. Even at the best of times, none of them look like this. You couldn't put this kind of thing together. The university would destroy you. There's alcohol and drugs everywhere. That is just going insane at all at a full volume, full blast. I'm like, no, no movie. This is this is something you can't do now because nobody believes that this is yeah. going to happen at all. It just it flatlines any credibility that you're watching anything relatable immediately. Which is sad because my second scene is I didn't really understand what this killer was doing for a little while. Uh -huh. We see the girls get picked off one by one, and we find out that he is indeed picking a doll out of them. He's killing them. He's taking parts of them with him. The weird thing is he's taking them and substituting them for mannequin parts, and that's what he leaves behind. Yes. You might find a a dead co-ed with her arms missing, but mannequin arms sewn on. Yeah. And when I finally saw what was happening, when they finally show one of the victims in full frame, I thought, what a waste, because this is the best thing in this movie. The con, the idea of this is creepy as hell. This is, yes, this is serial killer horror movie, disturbing sick. And, if you had been able to form a movie around the killer doing this, my God, what what a better movie this would have been. And I wept for the movie that, that could have been because somebody in this entire production had a great visual and it's just completely wasted on this movie. It's yeah. Sad. 
use it in a new film, I I give you permission for yeah. sure. Like they make a throwaway line that the sorority, uh, I think the mom sorority or this sorority that that Riley's now in is called the Dollhouse. We learned that. Oh movies. yeah, yeah. Here you go. You call this movie the Dollhouse, and you show <sighs> the face, and you do this thing where it turns out, you know, maybe that the the that the house mom is the killer. And she's, yeah. she can't take it anymore, and she's going to crack and whatever, because now that Riley's shown up on here, her, she can't comprehend it. That would have been a way better trope movie than what we got, because this movie doesn't even really, I'm not sure it even has tropes. I think it's a lot of M. Night Shyamalan they think is twist, and it's not twist, because it's so poorly done. Riley should have been the killer. That would have been at least, like, even if it was predictable, would have at least had a little bit more depth than the this valet yeah because we really get short chains especially in the miller thing because uh, shay is a great he's a good actor he does a good yeah. job with this but they give it away 20 minutes before the movie ends that oh my god uh, totally in, in the laziest way possible in the classic well the killer got injured and now you're sporting an injury but it's not like there's four other people with the same injury to throw you off it's like it's straight up he shows up to kill her with his killing bag full of stuff in his hands. It's like they didn't realize there was 20 minutes left. Like, at least put him in like a leather jacket or something. Come on. Yeah. Well, they luckily filled it with at least 10 minutes of badly reused cop car footage with <laughs> Andy Couture looking like he's trying to make it to McDonald's drive through because like, I need to carve up and I got to get there now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> to the point where they show the footage in the classic reverse frame. So it's mirror oh, image. Yeah. All the, all the type is backwards. And I'm like, Oh God, where, what are we doing? What are you doing movie? Oh, Bill, it's, it's hard. To admit that we watched this film. Would I watch the sequel? Of course. But. <laughs> Which it sets it, up. It does. It totally does. Um, but I think we have. Reached our limit on being able to talk about this film. Today. Uh, we do. We started. I should take this back. You started a new rating system. Over at Bill and Rob's. An excellent adventure. That I'm a big fan of. Um. If anyone wants to go check out our episode covering Trancers with the special guest, Frank Meyer, the amazing special guest, I should say. Amazing. Uh, um, I think we should rate this the same way we rated Trancers. Can you explain that to the audience? Yes. Uh, we came up with the idea that if you're old enough to remember video stores, dear viewers and listeners, there used to be a section, there always was one, and it was usually something called like Five Nights for a Dollar. It's where they put the movies where for a dollar, you could keep that movie the longest of any of the movies. And we decided that that was a good rating system for these extra episodes. So in the case of The Row, if you had found this in the Five Nights for a Dollar section, you've already plunked down your dollar, you've taken the movie home, and you've watched it. Would you keep it for the full Five Nights? Would you return it immediately? Somehow pretend that you hadn't rented it in the first place in this case to try to get your original dollar back. We're going to say you can't do that. So how long would you keep this movie, Rob? Would, would you keep it the full five nights or are you going to sell it short? Oh, I'm selling it short, buddy. I think that the row, the row gets one watch. So I'm keeping it for a night, but I think I would be too frustrated to like go back to the video store and find something else because I would have already like the movie's not that long. So it's not like I wasted too much time, but I think it would be more of a waste of my Friday night to drive back to movies at home, find another movie and risk it all over again. So what I would do is I would keep it for one night. So it gets a one. And then I would take it to the store the next day and be like, not can I speak to your manager, but can is there any way I can work out a deal? How about you? Yeah, I'm right there with you at the single category. It's it's just not fun on nah. any level. And it's sad to think that it actually could have been a decent little movie if they just stuck with the one good idea they had instead of the 15 terrible ones. Yep. But for me, it not only gets one night, I would one night it and then I would go back to the store, but I would make sure I would go back to North Campus video after hours 
nobody would see me. And I'm going to creep up to the drop slot and I'm going to shove the row into the slot. I'm not going to rewind this thing. That's just not going to happen. And I'm going to pray that none of the regulars in there see me having returned this movie and catch. You have your big blimp. floppy hat and trench coat on. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing this after hours on the fly. Nobody's going to catch me. And I am going to make sure that the next time I'm there, they see me with a copy of Beastmaster. And no, I'm not some weirdo who likes this terrible movie. That's just not going to happen. So yeah, one night and then back to the return slot in the dark of night. Oh man. Well, Bill, I am glad that you took the time to watch the row with me because that's what we do, man. Uh, I love doing this with you. It's always fun because the conversation is the best part. And if nothing else, if I got only the fun out of the conversation, that's it. Because I would love to have watched this movie in the same room with you because ripping it <laughs> would have been great. Yeah. But also, I love you enough that I'm not going to really make you pay for making me watch this thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to let it slide and not let it affect our friendship at all. Well, I appreciate it, Bill. Bill, before we take off today... Uh, why don't you tell the people a little bit more about Bill and Rob's An Excellent Adventure? I would love to. This is a project that I do with Rob's. We have our own podcast, Bill and Rob's Excellent Adventure. Find it anywhere you get your podcast. We try to take a look at different kinds of movies from all different spectrums with the idea of any movie can have some fun in it if you look hard enough, or at least if the concept is can have fun watching it if you talk about it with your friends so we try to find some gems well we stay a little bit away from more mainstream stuff we look for more fun things it's almost kind of a dare movies i've seen like hey robs you have to watch this robs will return volley to me and we take a run at it we see what we like about it and we have a great time we have some guests on every once in a while that like to come in and talk about it. it's a real positive thing there's enough negativity and hate watching in the world and that's not what we're about we just want to show that hey you there's good in a lot of these things so don't write it off as bad just because it's cheap or it's a b movie you can have a good experience that's what movies are supposed to be entertainment is supposed to be fun so let's have some fun with it and maybe we'll introduce some people to some things they wouldn't have watched which has happened we have gotten that feedback of i wouldn't have watched this without you making it sound like it was a fun time and more often than not nobody's called us back up and said you're terrible liars this movie was awful so i think we got a pretty good track record so please seek it out wherever you listen and give us a try we think you'll like it absolutely well bill this has been great uh, uh the conversation has been great the movie well I think it speaks for itself after we spoke about it this whole time maybe people will listen to this episode so they don't have to watch the movie but listeners as always, I really appreciate a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening to this podcast. The biggest thing you can actually do is uh, send a link to this episode to your VPR group chat. Anything that, uh, you know, another horror fan or Vanderpump Rules fan would love, please send them this episode. And to get more episodes ad-free and full length and extra little bonus content, head on over to patreon.com slash Vanderpump Robs. That's it for this episode, Bill. I will see you next time. And audience members, I will be with you next time on another episode of Vanderpump Robs. Wait, Rob? Is that who we're talking about? Yeah.